Well, I, I can't even get stills, but to get art talking anytime is always a bonus, so, you know. Oh my goodness, I have to make sense then. I guess I am feeling a little bit getting into my game, if, if that's what you're asking. You're like, I think, wow, it's sort of, sort of, you know, I sort of fluctuate. Like, you know, like I guess any any artist would have moments of, uh, of, um, you know, where you feel, wow, it's going well. Other part, I'm feeling now I I, I can do something. Uh, and then other moments where you feel, oh shit, you know, it's not working. But this this is working out pretty well, I think. And also people seem to people seem to be responding positively, uh, which I you know listen to in any case, but more so in a in a, in a situation like this because this is this is a public art for a, for a specific you know constituency, but uh, a mural is is becomes part of the architecture and it's it's there, you know, and so that makes it a different. It makes it, it makes it a different uh, thing. How do you spell Carson? C A R S O N. C A R S O N. All right. I knew that. Just need some help, Tom. C A R S O N. Whatever. Since it's Georgia politics in the twentieth century, there are you know certain people that will have to be recognized as as players and. And, and identified as such. So it's a little, it's a little different. Does this look like an old-fashioned car? Three E's and fiddle. I thought, I thought you were talking about 3D. <laughs> See now, look at that. There's, I shouldn't put in three D's and fiddle. One of the best singers is someone whom I recorded 33 years ago, who was a, 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 a deacon at, uh, uh, at Pilgrim Rest Primitive Baptist Church in, uh, in um, Oglethorpe, Georgia. And he is still around and still active. Uh, He's 80, 82 years old now, but he's a, he's an amazing singer. So we went down on the 17th of December, and and he got together some singers. It was it was very nice because some of them came from uh, a long distance away, like 60 miles away, just for a recording session. And then this one elder invited us to go down to their watch night, uh, which is. The New Year's, mm -hmm. you know, welcoming in the New Year, which they associate with the uh, with the emancipation. You know, because they say in, 19, in 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation proclaimed that they would be people that the blacks would be at least the ones in the uh, in the um, certain parts of the, in the rebellious states would be free. And so they associate the watch night with 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 that uh, emancipation. Does this does this look like a militia dude? This one? Very much. Right down here is going to be the race riot of Atlanta. Oh, well, I don't I don't believe they had on the spot photography of of the race riots and the massacres, so uh, as far as I know, the only graphic images were drawings. I don't know how accurate they were, but this is from Le Petit Parisien, Massacre des Negros dans les rues d'Atlanta, Massacre of Negroes in the Streets of Atlanta. Shows a streetcar, shows people. There are several pictures from these French, French uh, uh, 
uh, publications. So I'm going to put them kind of here in front of Du Bois, and he wrote a, a poem about the about the uh, tragedy of Atlanta. Who ran for president from Georgia in uh, 1920? And then they get stumped because they're trying to think of all the Georgia politicians. So I say, well, he wasn't a Georgian, but he was in, he was in Georgia because he was in the Atlanta Penitentiary. Uh, it was Eugene Debs, the socialist, who was uh, uh, serving time for opposing World War I. And he ran for president and got several million votes uh, in that election. And so this is a uh, maybe a little bit larger than uh, than uh, reality version of his campaign button, but um, I don't know. I think it reflects some of the different uh, different uh, political winds that we're blowing, don't you? It's public art, right? Mm -hmm. It seemed to when I was in grad school in Columbia during the, the 60s, most of my friends, um, my artist friends, uh, were more interested in Gustin's work than in de Kooning or Pollock or the other art artists. And they were, were all little Gustins, you know. I saw that show, the, the Marlboro show, that was so controversial. The critic Hilton Kramer you know, said, uh, he characterized Gustin as a Mandarin masquerading as a stumble bum. You know, he, he all I thought it was 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 uh, was you know uh, cartoons. You know these hooded figures. Of course, he did go back. He did do hooded figures back in his early early years. Uh, you know, commentary on the on the Ku Klux Klan, and um, I thought they were beautiful. Right? Uh, Augustine said that there were only there were two two of his uh, artist friends. Uh, Back, back to Bob. A few of the critics did, like Harold Rosenberg wrote some good, some positive things about it, although he backed away from it later on. Um, but, um, but de Kooning said, um, uh, to Augustine, he, uh, he said, uh, oh, every, everyone's, everyone's knocking you for those, those paintings. Uh, they say that you're you're getting political and you're copying out on abstraction and doing cartoons and all, but those paintings are about freedom. <laughs> Tell me about her again. Bonnie Loggins. Well, she's uh, I've known her for many years, and she's a uh, ballad singer and self-taught painter. But she's a character. Uh, she's. Uh, has a good sense of humor. It's a little eccentric. She's the eccentric artist of her family. But uh, I sprinkle through the, throughout the mural people who aren't famous, you know, Georgians who were on the scene. And since the title of the mural is Doors, uh, suggested by the fact that I deal with the door to Russell's office, uh, I had a couple of other doors in there, and she's opening a screen door. Uh, I had an image of that that I took, and uh, so maybe formally and in the meaning it'll connect. We'll leave that up to the viewer to, to figure out. There was a, I think it was, was uh, Camry Fontenot or Boisec Ardouin, one of those guys, said that his father didn't, you know, one of, the, one of these uh, black uh, French, uh, or I don't know if they even called it Zydeco in those days, um, but uh, you know, the French language, well, traditional music in Louisiana. And, and I heard him once being interviewed, and he said that his father didn't didn't want to be recorded because the recording companies were coming down and recording some Cajun music for these 78 RPM records back in the 20s and 30s. And his father didn't want to be recorded because well, he said, um, I don't want nobody listening to me after I'm dead. Now here we, and that's a, 
I can, you can see that if, you, if you're in the beginning of the age of recorded sound. It's good to have them, but it, I can see how you can be freaked out when it's a new idea in your head. See, that's what happens at this stage. Um, well, I don't even have all the underpainting done, like in that section, but, but um, the painting starts, every little bit starts talking to you. It says, oh, look at that, how, even though I know I'm going to go back to it, I said, look, it's got to get a fold under there, you know, a wrinkle, to make it, it, uh, it work. A kind of funny relationship to these source photographs. Um, they have a kind of authority because didn't Susan Sontag say that even the even the um, uh, most casual snapshot that doesn't even uh, think about being art has a has a power and a poignancy because it was witness to that moment. So if I'm using a, a, a source photograph, I say, well, I'm not going. I can't change where the molding is and, and around the window too much. Of course, I have artistic license. I can do it if I want, but, but I, I do I have a certain amount of respect for, for the authority of, of that witness that the photograph was there. Just, one of my students said something that surprised me a little bit. It was, um, it was a natural enough thing to say, but he said, oh, maybe make the, leave the old part, the past, and kind of sepia like an old old pictures and, 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 and then gradually go into the modern times where you get more color. And, and I knew what he was saying, but uh, no way. The whole thing is going to be f flesh people, flesh people through the medium of painting. Did you uh, play banjo on a, for the Cool Hand Luke soundtrack? Yes. <laughs> a little of it, yeah. I was living in New York, and uh, my friend Ed Can uh, somehow was called on to advise uh, Lalo Schifrin, the uh, composer who's still active. Lalo Schifrin's still composing music for Hollywood, and he did the score, and he wants some banjo music, so he listened Lalo Schifrin to listen to a bunch of banjo records that uh, Ed gave him. So, and he liked the kind of sound that I that I was on one of one of the records I played on. But it was, it was fun, but it was scary because I had to join the union for that one gig. It's the only union gig I've ever played. And I had to play a few, just little bits with, with, with a whole orchestra, you know. The, when the line goes across the screen, you don't hear the dialogue. That's when you start, and then the orchestra comes in. And I'd have to do re retakes because I'd, I'd mess up. And then music, other musicians will look at me because they do that every day. You know, they're just studio pros. You know, they don't mess up. I've been the only other recording sessions I'd ever been at were, were folk, little folk for little small folk labels where you could you screw up and you could do um, do ten takes of a little tune. You know, until you got the one you, you like. But they, they didn't do that. It was an interesting experience. Crops are all in, the peaches are rotten, the oranges are piled in their creosote. They've taken them back to the Mexico border to pay all their money and wait back again. Goodbye to my one, goodbye Rosalita, adios mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. Sometimes people ask me, do I paint every day? Because uh, I'm a painter, you know, and, and that means I have the studio, do I have this uh, studio work ethic? But I, I really don't because I do get involved in other projects and sometimes I, I paint every day uh, in my, in my uh, studio. And other times I get off of it and get into other projects. I don't worry about it the way I might have when I was younger because I don't have to prove to myself that I'm a painter. You know, I know, but this has been different because I don't want it to go on 
indefinitely, but I wanted, as I said a minute ago, I want to do it right. So I, um, you know, I, I do come here every day, uh, pretty much. Occasionally I have to be away for a day, and I come here on Saturdays because they're open from one to five on Saturday afternoon. Jamais le dimanche. I did paint um, uh, uh, regularly, and and you know would work, I guess, more intensely when when something was hot, when I had something going. But this is a, this is a different sort of thing because. I, I realized after I got the whole thing blocked in that it would take even longer than I thought it would. And it did, it did take quite a while. You could say it's a, um, it's a uh, personage or per that you're interacting with. Would that be too, sound too pretentious? I don't think so. Like Philip Guston, you know, I guess he talked about why he did his big figures in his late late period. He's he talked about bank art or stripes or Esperanto. You know, he said that you know you see the same stripes or color field paintings from Stockholm to Tokyo. You know, but uh, his paintings, you know, they say what's that? You know, people having a brick fight. Uh, you know, he says, well, what is what is that all about? But he said if he, when he was having dinner uh, at his house at Woodstock. You know, he he would be thinking of what was out there in his cinder block studio, and and he thought it was populated. Uh, and he didn't want to go out there after dinner and and re, re, rejoin that company. One co one comment that uh, years ago uh, a critic from the Fort Worth newspaper wrote about about my work that was in the New Orleans Triennial, which I really like and I, I remember, uh, he said that. I work the edge between illustration and abstraction. And you know, illustration is sometimes a pejorative term, oh, that artist is an illustrator. But I think what, I hope what he meant was illustrating, meaning you depict um, in a convincing way the stuff of the world. Um, and abstraction is the, is is the is the form that's that 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 you give it that that makes it something that that can can bear you know more more viewing and and that you can give a deeper reading of it. it'll give give the viewer uh, a, a more sustained experience because of the way it's put together. Um, I have a little gripe with a, a, some of the art that's being done these days where the, the form, the way the work is put together is, is, um, is intentionally not, not, not given much attention because it's the iconography, it's the message, it's the issue uh, that's being, being proposed. So you get, a, you get an installation with, with stuff that gives you a message about the issue but you don't get you don't get the the formal structure that carry carry you further uh, is your camera turned on no oh. <laughs>